Methodist Church. Is it a building? With some pews? A piano? And stained glass? Or is it something more? 2,000 years ago, the church was born. It wasn't made up of the famous, the rich, or the powerful. It was made up of everyday people who passionately believed in the message of Jesus. It was the beginning of a revolution of love and freedom that would change the world forever. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Today, the church is the largest single provider of healthcare in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. 100 out of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions. Places like Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Princeton. Much of the world's greatest art, architecture, literature, and music has been shaped by the church. But the impact of the church isn't just ancient history. Today, the church is stronger than ever and continues to impact every corner of the world. Over 300,000 churches in America and almost 5 million churches around the world stand ready to be instruments of change, to do what governments could never do. Every day, the church brings food and fresh water to millions of people across the world. It has a renewed passion to help widows and orphans and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. It stands ready as a first responder on the scene to provide relief for victims of disaster. The ripple of Jesus' impact can be clearly seen and felt in the church today. And it's made up of people like me and you. Today, you didn't just come to a building. You came to a revolution 2,000 years in the making. The world is facing as much trouble as ever. But we are not afraid. We were created for such a time as this. We will continue to do what we've always done. Proclaim the message of Jesus to help a world that needs him so desperately. Welcome. 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 Welcome to church. Welcome to West Shore, everybody. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Good morning. We're living in Florida. Isn't it great? Amen. Let's stand up as we open up this morning's worship service. What can I do with the fire on the inside? Say go. 
gonna do with this fire on the inside? I said, what you gonna do with this fire on the inside? This is what we live for. Go where you say go To let the whole world know You're the light in the darkness Oh, this is what we live for To love the way you love So God be lifted up Come be light in the darkness Oh, this is what we live for Oh, this is what we live for. Oh, this is what we live for. Oh, 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 this is what we live for. Oh, this is what we live for. Oh, this is what we live for. Oh. you're doing God's calling when Satan tries to keep you silent. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just acknowledge that you are creator of everything, giver of life, giver of everything that we have. And you're still our Father. You're our friend. And you're our comforter. Father, we pray right now that you would bind Satan up cast him out of this place that he would have no influence here and father that you would honor those that are here and those that will be watching online later on Lord and that you would bless their lives and bless their families father we pray that we truly take to heart the message of going out into the world and creating disciples father as we saw in the video caring for the orphans and for the widows Father, that we will spread your word and spread your love at every opportunity and every doorway that we have. And that we take that calling true to heart. And to remember that this is what we live for. It's not for money. It's not for prestige. The reason that we live is to bring you honor and to bring you glory. Father, that you desire to have a relationship with us, not because you own us, but because you love us. I pray for Pastor Tim as he brings your word this morning. Father, as we kick off this new series, I pray that you will just anoint his word and that you will anoint his spirit with the Holy Spirit today. Father, that you will allow us to feel your presence here. And Father, I pray that as we enter into communion later on in the service, Father, that we truly will take that to heart as well and that we will commune with you one-on-one. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The new year is often a time of reflection, a chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile and other times... They break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation, The old is gone, and the new has come. Let's see if mine's working. Yes, mine is working. How about that? 
Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. Welcome to West Shore. If this is your first time here or you haven't been here in a while, I'd like to invite you, if you would, to find in your worship guide a card called the Connection Card. If you would fill that out, we would appreciate it. And you can drop it in one of the offering plates, either in the front or the back of the church. And if you're watching online, you can go to wsfamily.net slash connect. There is an online connection card there that you can fill out as well. And as always, if you have prayer requests, we welcome those. If you're in-house, please fill out a card and drop it in the offering plate as well. And if you're watching online, send those uh, requests to info at westshorebaptist.org, and we will be sure to pray for your request. It is great to see everyone here. It's great to be with you, those of you that are watching online today. Our mission project, as you know, for the month of January is to help Mission Tampa out with PB&J. Thank you. Thank you already. We've got the steps filling up here. Please be sure to um, pick up whatever you can. Let us know when you find some really good deals. Um, just a couple of things. Make sure we're sticking to the small to medium-sized um, jars so that they can stick those in backpacks and uh, no glass containers, please. I don't know if they even make them anymore, uh, but you might find one here or there, but let's stick to the plastic so we don't have any accidents with those. Um, we are just so excited about what God's going to do. You know, that video was about a new year, and you know, new years are really a, a man-made uh, thing. We're the ones that came up with the calendar. Really, God gives us a new day every day that we should uh, look to him to start something new in our lives and to let him work and move. And so our prayer is that God will just do that this year. We are going to celebrate with the Lord's Supper communion a little bit later at the close of the service. If you're watching online, I would encourage you to go ahead and find some type of bread and juice in your home if you have it available and join with us as we uh, come to the Lord's table a little bit later and uh, follow his command with that. Um, we've tried to put a lot of emphasis over the past few months about missions in our church, and we do that a lot. We do them with our monthly mission projects. Um, as you know, I announced a couple of weeks ago that um, in our budget for this year, we have increased our mission giving um, from our tithes and offerings to 15%, up from 11% because of how God has blessed, and we are uh, just being faithful to what he has called us to do. I want to share with you where a little bit about where our mission dollars go. So we are part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, we are a Southern Baptist church, and the Southern Baptist Convention has a uh, mission organization called the cooperative program and basically it's that's just a fancy title for all the churches get together and pool their mission dollars together and we're able to help a bunch of missionaries and there are two arms of that um, of, of that giving one is the IMB which is the International Mission Board and the other is NAM N-A-M-B and that is the North American Mission Board and those dollars go to help start churches and do relief stuff here in the United States. I'd like to share with you a little bit about NAM this morning. So would you watch this video? It'll help you to understand a little bit more about where our offerings, our mission dollars go to. Let's watch this video about NAM. Every Sunday morning, you hit snooze. Once, maybe twice. You blow dry, you button down, you buckle up. You squeeze into your Sunday best. You keep your hands and feet and neckties in the car at all times. You come early. You run late. You sing, you listen, you preach, you pray. And then you go. And wherever you are led to go, wherever you dream of going, we are there. We are the North American Mission Board. With tools, with training, with two different pathways, we connect you and your church to your next missional opportunity. When you want to welcome a refugee who's lonely, when you want to rescue a teenager who's trafficked or feed a man who's hungry, 
when you want to care for a child who's neglected or rebuild a home that's flooded, Send Relief gives you and your church real life opportunities to learn and do in places where churches are not, where the population is big, but the gospel influence is small, where missionaries are called to start something from nothing. Send Network gives resources and training and support. And Send Network connects your church with church planners so that together you can change the world. There are thousands of them. Church planning missionaries, send relief missionaries, in big cities and small towns, feeding and teaching and loving, planning 25 churches every single Sunday and baptizing thousands of new believers every single year. They give their lives and you give your treasure. You send these missionaries out into the world when you and your church sacrificially give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering and the cooperative program. And there are thousands more chaplains in foxholes and police cars and hospitals and workplaces. They all need you. And you need them. Because outside the four walls of your church, where they are, that's where you are at your best. Every believer really can one day live on mission. You and your church just need the very best tools to make it happen. That's why we exist. That's why we create resources like the three circles. Because whether it's an evangelism tool you download to your phone, or a compassion ministry our Send Relief experts help you launch, or a new church you help start through the Send Network, everything we do is centered on helping you and your church share the gospel. That's why we all do what we do every Sunday morning and every day after that. So as you pray, as you go, and as you discover what living on mission looks like in your world, the North American Mission Board is here for you. So I think it's really important that we understand that when we um, give our tithes and our offerings that we are supporting mission organizations. Now, not everybody's called to go and plant a church, but because you give, you're planting a church. Not everybody can be part of NAM going to Colorado where there are fires and helping send relief, but because of your mission dollars, you can be part of that. So as you um, prepare to give each week or monthly or however you do it, whether you give online, whether you do uh, a bill pay, however you do it, I would encourage you to do this. Before you give, pray. Pray for those that those dollars will go to impact because it truly is part of a great mission organization that we can be a part of. And so I, I, I just love talking about this because there's no, there are no other organizations like the IMB and, the, and NAM around the world. They do so much incredible work, and we get to be a part of it. That's exciting to me. All right, Pastor Jay. Here he is. All right, Joey. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. So this next song really, it, it touches my heart a lot. Um, it's just as I am. And as we kick off this new series about answering God's call on our lives, a lot of times you'll hear, well, I can't do that because I don't know how or I'm not ready. Pastor Tim has preached on it. I, I, I've preached on it. God doesn't ask for abilities. He wants availability. And that's what he's looking for in, in, in our lives is he'll take us just like we are. And he'll make us what he wants us to be. And it doesn't matter what we have with us, what we tag along with us, what we bring along with us, what we think we need to leave behind or anything else. In God's eyes, we are exactly what he wants, just the way that we are. Even with all of our differences, in God's eyes, we're all the same. We're his children, and he accepts us just as we are. In shackles and chains, 
Hey! 
thinking as we were singing that song and my mind took me back to my childhood. That was a long time ago, I know, for some of you thinking that, but I was thinking of the, the church that I grew up in, and I don't think it was probably every Sunday, but boy, it seemed like it was every Sunday. We sang that old Just As I Am song, all five verses, depending on the, uh, the edition of the hymnal you had, you, it was either four or five, and we would sing it, and... Um, the, the wonderful, loving pastor that I had. Um, th- this should make you all appreciate me now, okay? Um, he, during that song, in between the verses, he would preach the entire sermon over again. And, and so, um, so my mind just went back to that, and I don't, I don't know where this is coming from, but other than the Holy Spirit, to be reminded of how much God loves us to accept us just the way we are. I mean, I I don't know if you have ever really truly thought about that, but we're pretty awful sometimes. I mean, am I right or am am I, is it just me? Maybe it is just me. I don't know, but, but, but our nature is pretty bad. I mean, we're just one step away from doing some pretty bad things. But by the grace of God, he accepts us just as we are so that he won't leave us just as we are. That's pretty powerful. And that was all free. That, was, that wasn't even in the lineup this morning. Man, that wasn't the sermon, though. I want to read for you a verse as we move into our prayer time, our focus prayer time this morning. John chapter 15, verse 13. Um, if you recall, we spent several weeks going through the book of John and some key chapters in there. But I want to read for you verse 13. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. Now, when we hear that verse, our minds automatically go two places. Number one, it goes to Jesus dying for us on the cross, naturally. But a lot of times, it goes to those that put their, themselves in harm's way for us. But I think there's something more to that verse. And it's the idea that we, as followers of Christ, desperately need one another. I think one of the tragedies, one of the great tragedies of the past couple of years with COVID is that many believers have been led to believe that they can go through this life and be an effective follower of Jesus by themselves. We can sit at home. We can watch church online. We can watch church on our TV. It's great. You got a big screen and you put me up on the big screen. That should drive you back to church just (laughs) just in there, okay? I mean, I saw that when, when, when I had COVID, I remember watching, preaching at my home and then watching it, and I was like, that is scary. We need each other. We were made for relationship, and we were made for fellowship with other believers. We were not made to go through this alone. And there is so much in our world that strives to divide us. And we need to be brought back together to love one another. So as things still spin out of control, I want to challenge you this morning. And and Corey's going to come and pray for us and pray with us in this regard. That we begin once again anew to start thinking about one another. 
we have a, a, a lot of people right now with this, uh, with the Omicron variant that, that are getting COVID again. Thankfully, the, the, the symptoms are mild, it seems, in most cases. But, but we have a lot of people getting it. When was the last time you called somebody that you knew had it and asked how they're doing? For those that have come back to church physically, have you looked around to see who isn't here? Have you contacted those people? You see, we were meant to be in this together. We need the fellowship of one another. That is exactly why God ordained the church. Not to go through life alone, but to go through it together and to lean on one another, to, to, to stand with one another, to lock arms with one another for missions and, and for, for evangelism and for discipleship and all of those things. I just can't emphasize it enough. We need each other. We need each other. So let's pray that we will have renewed emphasis to look out for one another. Corey? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you saying thank you again for allowing us another day, allowing us another opportunity to hear your word, to, to worship in your house, and to, to live the life that you've called each of us to live, Lord. Right now, we live in a time where it seems like, you know, we, we've never been more connected with the, the opportunities with the internet and all those things, but at the same time, we've also never been further apart, Lord, it seems like. So I just pray right now that, that we all look for opportunities to be the church, to be your hands and feet, to be that connection to the outside world and to each other that you've called us to be. As Pastor Tim said, help us to not be so wrapped up in our own bubble that we take time to look and notice who hasn't been here, who may have been sick, who needs this or that, or, you know, just randomly reaching out to people and saying, hey, how are you doing? Like, and truly mean, hey, how are you doing? Not just the casual greeting that we throw out sometimes, Lord, to truly take in what that person says. And then when they tell you how they're doing, say, all right, well, I want to pray for you about X, Y, and Z. Lord, I just pray that we look for that opportunity, Lord, that we be those servants that you've called us to be and that we be the loving, empathetic, just outreach for you here on earth, Lord, that we would show your feelings, your emotions, and your calling to be with each other that you've placed on each and every one of us, Lord. We know that, that even in times when people were sick, you went to them. Even when uh, people were sinners, you went to them, Lord. I just pray that we, that, that we abide by that calling, Lord. I'm, I'm not calling for us to be reckless or calling for us to do anything crazy or anything like that, but, I mean, how hard is it to, to pick up the phone and call somebody? How hard is it to stop by somebody's house that lives near you, knock on their door, and even if they want to be distant, stand in their yard and have a conversation in person with them? Lord, I just I pray that we look for those opportunities and that we that we feel the burden of this calling, Lord, and that it not be a burden of negativity, but a burden of, of just inspiration and motivation that we're called to do this and that we're inspired to do this, Lord, and that you just bless each and every one of us because of it, Lord. So I just pray that we, that we get out of our own shell, that we stop being so self-centered and that we look for opportunities because there are so many out there for us to, to connect with you and your people. So I just pray for that for each and every one of us to take up that calling individually and use our own unique abilities that you've given us to do so. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we are excited today to start a brand new teaching series called Count Me In. Count Me In. And what we're going to do and the direction we're going to go in this series is to try to um, reignite an understanding within each of, each of us the call that as followers of Jesus, God has placed on our lives. The greatest thing that anyone can ever experience is the day that you 
recognized your need for Jesus and surrendered your life to him. You made him your savior, but you also made him your Lord. That is absolutely the greatest day in any person's life. In just a few days, we will celebrate the 28th birthday of our oldest. There's a vision still implanted in my brain of the day that he was born. And as tears rolled down my face, Karen's mom looked at Karen after she had just given birth and pointed to me and said, is he okay? No comments, nothing. One of the greatest days of my life, followed by two more. And as much as those days are important to me, I still have to say the greatest day in my life was the day that I realized I had a need for a Savior, and I said yes to him. My prayer is that you have that same understanding in your life. But here is the deal, folks. That is just the beginning. It is not the end of the story. You give your life to Jesus. You make him your Savior and your Lord. And that starts a lifelong journey because when you did that, God placed a call on your life. He placed a call on your life with a specific purpose for you to fulfill as a follower of Jesus. And so if we go through this life as Christians and never understand that call and never put it into to action, all we've done is made Jesus our Savior. You see, God wants more for us than just Jesus being our Savior. He wants Him to be our Lord. And when He is our Lord, we start living for Him instead of living for ourselves. You've heard the, the, the phrase in our culture that you, when you live your life, you've got to look out for number one. Right? You've heard that. Well, I stand before you today to tell you who number one is. It is not the person you see in the mirror every morning. It is the one that you said you gave your life to. And so because a call has been placed on each one of our lives, we have to be willing to say to Jesus, count me in. Count me in. I am in this for the long haul. I am not here just to say, good, I've got my ticket and I'm going to spend eternity with you. No, I'm going to fulfill the call that you have placed on my life. And folks, I want to tell you, it doesn't matter where you came from, where you're going, where you are right now. God has a call on your life and he wants you to fulfill it. And he doesn't want it to be an afterthought. He doesn't want you to think, well... If I get some time off from work, I'll fulfill that call. No. Well, if things slow down in my life, I'll fulfill that call. Can I tell you a secret? Things don't slow down. They don't. In fact, if you are sitting here this morning or you're watching online and you're thinking, things are pretty calm right now. If anybody's sitting around you or standing next to you, they might want to move out of the way. Because something's coming. Something absolutely is coming. 
So we need to say to Jesus, count me in. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about this calling that God has placed on our lives. We're going we're gonna to explore some, some thoughts and some ideas of how we can live these things out and how we can stay devoted to them. You know, one of my favorite uh, sayings is that the world is filled with a bunch of great starters, but a bunch of poor finishers. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You know how it is. Some of us are like that just naturally. You're great starters. You've got these great ideas. I want to do this. And you get halfway through it, and you, you just you give up. What God wants is some great starters and some great finishers. Now, that, that takes some, some uh, intestinal fortitude, if you will. That takes some stick to itness. It takes some prayer. It takes some devotion. And it takes being willing to go through the tough times in life and stick to what God has called you to do. I hope you know that the easiest thing in the world to do is just to give up. That's the easy way out. But that's not what God wants for us. And so we have to figure out what this call is on our life. And the first thing we have to understand is what we're going to talk about today. And that is part one. We all have been given an invitation. We have all been given an invitation. And our, our key verse for this, uh, this series we're not going to dive into the chapter that I, I got this verse from, but I think it's really key that we, we use this as foundation. If you've, if you've never read the calling of Isaiah, you need to go to the Old Testament. For those of you who don't know, that's where the book of Isaiah is. It's in the Old Testament. And, and read the call of Isaiah. Just read it and, and see how powerful it is. It's where we get the words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because Isaiah felt the call from God. And in chapter 6, verse 8, this is our key verse. Isaiah said this. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Father, we come to you this morning, and in the next few minutes, help us to hear your voice in the same way. Help us to hear you say, Who will I send? But Father, more importantly, help us to answer the call the way Isaiah did. Help us to say, here am I, Lord, send me. And we thank you that you have called us. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. God says, who will I send? Isaiah answers that call. He says, here am I, send me. And the question for us is this. How are we going to respond to the invitation that we have been given from God. You see, the problem that we face is that we have been told that we don't need to do anything for our salvation. And that's true, and yet it's not true. Okay, Jesus took care of all the hard work. But there is something that we need to do. We need to say yes. And then once we have said yes, we need to be willing to follow through with that. And so there are a couple of things about this invitation that we need to understand. Number one, and I hope you're taking notes, your first fill in there on your outline is that with this invitation, we have been invited into Jesus' presence. 
We have been invited into his presence. You see, we need to understand that without Jesus, we have no right to come into the presence of God. But because of Jesus, we have every right and every ability to come into that throne room of grace and talk to God. We have been invited. Now, there's a wonderful story that I want to just give you a, a short synopsis of, and then we're going to use a couple of verses from it uh, to kind of dive into this. So Jesus is invited to a guy's house for a dinner party. Jesus loved to go to dinner parties. You find him over and over again going to, to all different kinds of dinner parties. And so he's invited to this dinner party, and during the middle of the, the dinner, this woman comes in, and this woman has a reputation. And she comes up to Jesus, and she's got this jar, this alabaster jar of expensive oil, and she starts anointing Jesus with this oil. She washes his feet. She kisses his feet. She surrenders herself to Jesus. And I want you to look at what the Bible says about this in Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Jesus invited this woman into his presence. And folks, he has done the same thing to us. In spite of all of our garbage... Jesus invited us into his presence. I want you to think about that. As terrible as we are, he has invited us into his presence. I'm not sure that we grasp how powerful that is. If you've had a checkered past, you may understand it a little bit more than those who haven't. But no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what your struggles are, no matter what your victories are, you have been invited into the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is is something to shout about. In fact, I'm not sure how you can sit there and not give praise to God when I say those things. Let me say that again. I'm not sure how you can sit there without giving praise to God when I say those things. How about some praise for God? Wow. Pastor Jay, maybe we need a communion right now. We have been invited into the presence of God, and that is something to get excited about. Secondly, we have been invited into his presence in spite of our sin. In verse 39 of this same story, in chapter 7, the Bible says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. He says, if Jesus knew, Jesus does know, by the way, he would have said, get away from me, you're a sinner. But in spite of her sin, and in spite of your sin, and in spite of my sin, guess what? We are invited into the presence of majesty. We are invited into his presence. And that is something special. So you see, we've been given this invitation to come into his presence in spite of our sin. And that 
leads us to a very burning and digging question. What will we do with the invitation? Throughout our country and throughout the world, every Sunday morning, sometimes multiple times on Sunday morning, pastors and ministers stand up and proclaim the gospel. And sadly, it often falls on deaf ears. The question before us is what will we do with the invitation? As this story progresses in verses 44 through 46, let's see how Jesus responds to the woman and to the, the guy who invited him to the, the dinner party. Listen to what Jesus says. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. So what took place here in this story, it was customary in homes to have, number one, a basin at the door and often a servant there to wash the grease and the grime and the junk off of people's feet because they didn't have closed-toed shoes. If you think your feet are gross, imagine if you think your feet are gross, if you think the person who lives with you has gross feet, imagine walking through the desert with sandals. How much worse that would be. And so they would have this basin for their feet to be washed. There's not a lot of bathing going on during this time. And so they would have oil to make things not so pungent. This guy offered Jesus none of this. And this sinful woman came in and Jesus invited her into his presence in spite of her sin and allowed, him to, allowed her to minister to him. Now the reason I bring this up is because it is obvious what this woman did with the invitation. She accepted the invitation. The question is, what are we going to do with the invitation? I was listening to a, uh, a podcast this week, and the speaker was talking about how when you lead somebody to Christ, it takes two things. You have to build a relationship with the person, and then you have to introduce them to Jesus. And his contention was that in the church in America, we have done one of the two things, but forgotten about the second one. We have been taught and we have been told that we have got to get out there and, and build relationships with non-believers. And some have become very good at that. But there's like a brick wall that stops them from going any further. You see, what Jesus wants us to do is to build relationships with those non-believers, but then at some point, build enough trust, build enough integrity to turn the corner and say, could we have a talk about some spiritual issues? I'd really like to get to know what your thoughts on spiritual things are. But sadly, what has happened is we have accepted only half of the invitation. We have said, okay, I'll go out and make some friends with some non-believers. Actually, they're more fun than the Christians. And so we do that, but we never get to the point to say, 
How's your relationship with God? You know, I found that that people are not afraid of that question. In fact, people want to have that conversation. Now, they may want to have the conversation so they can debate you about it, so you've got to be prayed up and studied up about it. But we have got to get to the point that we not just build relationships with people, but we do what this woman did. We accept the invitation and we do something about it. Imagine, if you will, if this woman had been allowed into this house and all she did was stand over in the corner and look at Jesus. In today's world, we'd be like, well, that's a stalker. She's a creeper. But instead, she went up to Jesus and did what the owner of the home was not willing to do. So my question for you and for myself is, are we willing to do what no one else is willing to do? I mean, it's wonderful that we provide peanut butter and jelly. There are hungry hungry kids out there that need to eat on the weekend. It's wonderful that we send disaster relief teams. It's wonderful that we do all these things, but folks, at some point, we have got to talk to people about Jesus. We have to talk to them about Jesus. And so we have to answer the question, what are we going to do with the invitation? You know, it's funny that in that story, all we hear about is that one woman who went to Jesus. This is a dinner party. There are all kinds of people there. Nobody else went to Jesus but this one one woman. Are we going to be the one to go to people who need to hear about Jesus? And the reason we need to do this is because we all at one point in our lives we're in the same place that those people who don't know Jesus are. We all have a story that leads us to Christ. We all have a story that leads us to Christ. Listen to verses 47 and 48. Jesus said this, I tell you, Her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Our story, your story and my story, is all part of the process that leads us to Christ. What we have to understand is that Our story is not intended to push us away from Christ. It's intended to draw us to him. And everyone we come in contact with has a story. If for no other reason, you ought to talk to people just to hear their story. Can I tell you there's some crazy stories out there? There's some wild stories out there. Stuff that just will leave your your eyes wide open. You're like, wow, my life is not that bad. But every story, every story is meant to lead a person to Christ. Every story. And the reason that we're led to Christ is twofold. As I said at the beginning. So that we can receive forgiveness and so that we can receive our calling from God. That is what happened to Isaiah. Look with me at verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 6. After he had seen this image of the Lord God, the Bible says, Then one of the seraphim, these special angels, 
flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Folks, that is what happened to us when we came to Jesus. Jesus took that coal just like the seraphim and he touched you and he cleansed you so that you could spend eternity with him. But folks, let's not leave it there. He did not die just so we could spend eternity with him. He died and he rose from the grave so that we could have a purpose, that we could have a calling, and we could lead others to him. And can I just tell you, it is my belief that it just breaks God's heart when we're not doing that. When we are so consumed with all the other things that we think are important in our lives. Can I tell you that there is nothing really important except the souls of those who do not know Jesus? You've got them in your life. You've got family members who don't know Jesus. You've got co-workers who don't know Jesus. You've got neighbors who don't know Jesus. You've got friends who don't know Jesus. You've got children who don't know Jesus. Let me really step in it. You've got grandkids who don't know Jesus. We need to be about God's business. We need to answer the call. We need to accept the invitation that he has given us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And Father, my prayer is that we will all accept the call that you have placed on our lives. Father, you have done so much for us. You have provided salvation for us. You have provided eternity for us. But Father, you want so much more for us. You want us to answer that call. And my prayer right now, Father, is that each of us will say yes to the invitation that you have given us. Yes to the invitation for salvation but yes to the invitation to accept the call you've placed on our lives. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a perfect transition to move into celebrating the Lord's table, coming to him in communion. Because, you know, Answering the call of Christ on our lives is such a serious, serious thing. And so we come this morning to the Lord's table. If you did not pick up the elements for the Lord's Supper, just lift your hands and the deacons will get you a couple in the back. You know, Paul addresses the Lord's Supper. And one of the things he says is that we should not enter into this time lightly. We should not enter into it when things just aren't right. When relationships are broken, when there's sin in our life. And so as we prepare to partake, would you just spend this time with God asking Him to let you know where things need to be changed? And then ask Him to give you the boldness to make those changes. 
So the Bible tells us that after Jesus and his disciples had eaten the Passover meal, what we now call the Last Supper, Jesus said, that's not the end of what we're doing tonight, guys. In fact, what lies ahead of us is pretty heavy. Specifically, he said, it's pretty heavy for me. He picked up what we would call unleavened bread, what they use for the Passover meal, and he broke it. And he said, guys, I want you to take a piece of this. And as you eat it, I want you to know that this is my body that is about to be broken for you. On Christmas Eve, we showed the, the video from the series The Chosen, the one that started it all, and it was a story of the birth of Christ through the eyes of a shepherd. And if you recall in that video, if you were with us, um, that shepherd was looking for a spotless lamb. And at the end of it, he was asked, did you find the spotless lamb? And he got this big grin on his face. He didn't have to answer because the answer was, yes, I have found the spotless lamb. And his name is Emmanuel. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we say thank you for what Jesus did for us. We thank you that he is our sacrifice, that he took our place, that he provided salvation for us, that he provided a home in eternity with you. But Father, we say thank you that you have placed, because of that, a call on our lives that all you want us to do is to say yes to. So we say thank you right now as we say yes for your body that was broken for us. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. He said, take and eat. This is my body. After they ate, after they, ate they took the cup. Jesus blessed it. He said, this is my blood. It's a new covenant, a new beginning. Every day that we wake up is a new beginning. And it's a chance to renew that covenant with Jesus when we go to him in prayer every morning when we get up. It's a chance to say, I'll answer your call today prayerfully a little better than what I did yesterday. Amen. Amen. It's a chance to say, I'll be a Christ follower a little better today than I was yesterday. It's a chance to say, I'll be closer to you today than I was yesterday. But what's so amazing about it and that we can take joy in is that Jesus says, I don't remember yesterday. I don't remember how far you were away from me. All I remember is that you're right here with me now. Amen. Amen. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. Join me in prayer. Father, as we remember that blood that was shed for us, 
Father, allow it to draw us closer to you and to know that our sins have been forgiven once and for all. Father, to know that the only thing that separates us from you is us. But to know that you are waiting there. As we sang earlier, Father, with a ring and a robe ready to throw your loving arms around us. Amen. Amen. Each and every day, regardless of what happened the day before. And we are grateful for that. We thank you for this opportunity. And we come to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. He said, take and drink. You know, this is one of the most holy times of everything that we do as we remember what Jesus did for us. But I wonder if this morning, as we've come to the Lord's table, if there's something in your life that you need to get right, now would be the time to do that. Maybe you just need to talk to God. Maybe you just need to pour your heart out to Him. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Him. Maybe you've never said yes to answering that call. I don't know. Maybe it's something as simple as baptism. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you want to say to God, Yes, I want to follow you in believer's baptism. We're going to stand and sing. The deacons will be at the door for our benevolence offering as usual. Um, But if there's something that God's placed on your heart this morning, I would love the opportunity to pray with you. So let's just stand together. Let's sing this song as a prayer. Let's just come into the presence of God. We've been invited. Pastor Jay.
more time. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. What a prayer for today. May that be our prayer. Corey dismisses. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you saying thank you again. Thank you so much for this message. Thank you so much for this time spent. Thank you so much for being able to uh, take part in communion and the Lord's Supper, Lord. I just pray that each and every one of us would take on this calling, that each and every one of us would get out there and get connected with each other, Lord. Stop living our lives behind screens and start living them out in the world, making an impact for you, Lord. I pray that you keep us all safe, protected, and healthy. Bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.